This week, the agenda measured the economic merits of joining forces with the United States. We pondered just how green Ontario's green bonds program is, and we also looked at the aftermath of Heinz leaving Leamington. The agenda's week in review begins with a check-in at City Hall. Well, you all want to talk party politics, so let's get into this right now. And uh, John Ibbotson from the Globe and Mail was a guest on this program not too long ago, and he had this to say about party politics as it relates to the Rob Ford situation. Roll tape, please. If this were to happen in Ontario or any other province, or if it were to happen at the federal level, and you had a premier or a prime minister who was so bloody-minded that he or she refused to step down even though there was incredible evidence of, of major wrongdoing, at some point the party itself would step in. At some point the caucus would, would close the door and say to the leader, you can't be our leader anymore. Um, and we have means, if we absolutely must, to vote against you in the legislature if it comes to that. Part of the problem here is that um, at, at Toronto City Council and, and in most cities uh, around the country, you don't have a party system. So there is no one that can advise Rob Ford or that can warn Rob Ford or that can punish Rob Ford except maybe Doug Ford, his brother. Um, and, and it's a caucus of two. I would argue that, that the checks and balances are there. And it's because municipalities are a creature of the province. Both other levels of government, provincial and federal, have their own degrees of autonomy. They have their own degrees of con control. So they need to be able to control each other when things like this happen. The province is supposed to be able to control the municipalities if something happens. Now, we all saw how Premier Wynne has been handling this. And to her credit, I think she did a pretty good job of nicely stepping around this one by saying all parties would have to agree before she removed Ford uh, mm -hmm. from power or, or whatever she planned to do. But at the end of the day, I mean, I believe those checks and balances are there. The reason why we don't have the ability to remove our, ourselves is because we're creatures of the province. It's the province that, uh, they're the ones who are supposed to step in and say, um, okay, there's a problem here. We need to, to well, restructure this. No, except I, that, uh, go I, ahead. I mean, if the province tried to step in and do something on a council nowadays, I mean, that would be pretty outrageous, wouldn't it? It would, but here, but I, I respectfully very much disagree with you, and here's why. Um, we, we actually have more scrutiny in larger councils like Toronto or Ottawa because they have sophisticated media there. The smaller councils, there are there are checks and balances, you're correct. We have the Municipal Act, there are legis there's legislation about closed door meetings. But the problem is, and we've seen this with the Ombudsman of Ontario's report, is that it's always abused. And I What's was abused? the process. A lot of these processes are abused. So for example, when we have in camera meetings, there there's a list of criteria, but that is many councils if they want to keep you know, certain conversations out of the public will uh, will look at that in the most broadest of terms, and then they will abuse that. I mean, I believe in uh, transparency, and I think that you, those you got in trouble for this many times. <laughs> but like I you, always you, stuff that stuff that council, in its wisdom, has said ought to be kept in camera. You've written about the Toronto Sun. But, but then an in-camera meet, sorry, a closed-door meeting investigator came in subsequently and said that vote should not have been in camera. And, you know, council never changed that. So, it, I mean, there's... But would party politics make a difference to any of this? The the, the upside to party politics is that as, as a municipal councillor, I'm very busy. I'm part I'm considered a part-time councillor. So many times I do a lot of my own work. I, you know, I go to constituents' homes. I deal with a lot of... I, I research a lot of issues on an agenda. Um, and that's a full-time job. So if, if you were to have a party, that could be those, you know, I would have resources to help me with that because it's a lot of work. On the other hand, the advantage of not having party is that, you know, one of the things that I love about my job is the freedom of, of independent thought. And I don't have to be told or I don't need a party whip to tell me how to think or say what to say. So that's, there's, yep. there's advantages and, and sure. disadvantages. And we can't just invent party politics. We can't uh, uh, say, oh, we want party politics, so all of a sudden we're going to have it. If people wanted party politics in municipal government, there's nothing stopping uh, that. People could organize. When people have done that in Ontario, they've usually lost quite uh, dramatically. Mm -hmm. There is an interesting wrinkle to that, though. Uh, if there were party politics, um, I would think the party people would probably want to have uh, closed meetings to figure out what their uh, uh, policy was going to be. And the Ontario Ombudsman would come along and say, oh, you can't meet in, um, in private. I think that's outrageous. I, I agree that if a council, council goes into a closed meeting, uh, they shouldn't transact other business. But I think it's very necessary for politicians to talk to each other out of the council and try to figure out what's going on. The Brampton Guardian, I don't know if you like the Guardian, but they're your local newspaper, and they FOI'd your expenses, and they came up with a lot of things that, again, um, 
I guess, forced you into a position of having to justify why our taxpayers paying for this. And uh, Sheldon, I'm on the top of page two now. Let's do this list here. Uh, sponsoring your own luncheon, $14,000. A seat upgrade for a trip that you took to India, over $3,000. Two ads for holidays celebrated in India, north of $2,600. Personalized barbecue aprons, $2,000 plus. Mandarin language lessons, almost $1,400. These are things that taxpayers, I gather, foot the bill for. And I guess people want you to defend why you think that ought to have been the case. Well, and again, the mayor's budget is approved annually by council, and I've never exceeded the budget. So in the mayor's budget is an account for marketing, advertising, and promotion. And that's a council-approved annual line item in our budget. We don't exceed it. So I don't know if you could put that list back up. Can we put like it back to, up? I'd like to refer to it. That's just... Okay, there's the list. Okay, so the ones you've selected, sponsorship for my own luncheon is not my luncheon. It's the Brampton Arts Council. It's called Mayor's Luncheon for the Arts. It was originally uh, presented by the late Mayor Ken Willens. We continued the tradition, and there's an approximate $5,000 sponsorship that transparently is seen and moves from the Office of the Mayor budget to Brampton Arts Council. It's part of my budget and then becomes part of their budget. It's uh, it's. It's not an expense on Susan. But let's, it's part of the okay. uh, Mayor's Luncheon for the Arts, where they name the Arts Person of the Year. I get you, but I, and, so and I don't want to take. I hear you. I don't okay. want to spend too much time on all this stuff. But just so I understand, are you saying that essentially you have a global budget in your office from which you are permitted to make expenditures covered by taxpayers on any number of different things, and you have some discretion on how to spend those things? Correct. Is that fair to say? Correct. And over okay. seventy percent of that money is given to community groups, the mayor's youth team, seniors groups, youth groups, uh, a variety of requests that come to the office of the mayor. It's not Susan's expenses. Okay, I get you. Very important. But should, should, should taxpayers be paying Susan's Mandarin lessons? Well, you know, and we're, I represent a very multilingual municipality, as you know. So any tool that can help me, in my opinion, uh, better communicate, better do my job. Legitimate, I would say legitimate is business legitimate expense. business expense. We were scheduled to go to China, which we did several months later. Now, on a four-day intensive course, uh, you you are able to learn Toronto Mandarin School. Excellent. Uh, the fundamentals to be able to at least greet, introduce. It's such a courtesy to be able to communicate. I wish I could communicate in all the languages of Brampton. Uh, we were able to take Mandarin. It was offered between Christmas and New Year's. Can you imagine? So dedicated to language learning, we said, what's available between Christmas and New Year's? There was a Mandarin course. We signed up. Okay, and, but and you know that, you know that again, you're taking a bit of a hammering on this because Rob Ford and Hazel McCallion have budgets that are infinitely smaller than yours. And you know, this is, this is an important point. This is why we called for a more open and transparent government. I said to council, let's have a discussion. If this is an issue, why do I have these elements in the budget of the office of the mayor? Why am I asked to pay for the wreaths that we place on the cenotaph on Remembrance Day? Take it all out. We don't need to have donors and sponsorship funds in the budgets of the office of the mayor in Brampton. Take them out, take them away. It doesn't need to be there. Since well before Canada was a country, our neighbor to the south has grown and prospered over time becoming a veritable superpower, the torchbearer for Western democratic values. The United States is also our primary economic partner. We share similar values and security concerns. And it is for these reasons and more that journalist and author Diane Francis says a merger of our two countries makes sense. It's all outlined in her new book, Merger of the Century, Why Canada and America Should Become One Country. And here's Diane Francis now. Nice to have you back here. Great to be here. You never write about controversial stuff. It's always so easy for you. All right, let me, let me do one quote from the book, which will really get us into the, we'll get the fur fry, flying here. Here you go. My advice to Canadians is that loathe America or love it, a merger is the best and only comprehensive solution we have, notwithstanding the political challenges it would present. This transaction would be the most audacious and important in the history of either nation. On the other hand, it would be less difficult than the amalgamations the Germans and Europeans have achieved, or what the plucky South Koreans envision, and the rewards would be far greater. Okay, let's go through this. Why do you think this makes sense now? 
Well, I think it, it's probably made sense for a long time, and it will for a long time to come. Uh, I wrote this book because I really believe that both countries have to pose to themselves the existential questions that need to be answered going forward. Canada is a relatively small economy mm -hmm. and a relatively small population with the second biggest piece of real estate. We can't develop it, we've neglected it, and we can't even defend it. We have a Navy with 8,500 people. So what do we do? The Russians have declared the Arctic is theirs. The Chinese are starting to target and make inroads in our resource industry. Our border with the Americans after 26 years of free trade is worse than it was before. Worse in what respect? Thicker, thicker. thicker. We have all kinds of impediments to trade. I know manufacturers in Canada that are having to build branch plants in the U.S. because of the delays in the red tape and the cost of doing business. And this is supposed to be a free trade zone. So we've never gone those next steps toward eliminating the border like the, like the Europeans have. And then the United States. I mean, the United States is going to need resources going forward. It's going to need opportunities going forward. And bearing down on both of us is state capitalism. And this is a new model, economic model, embodied in the Russians, the Arabs, and the Chinese, which is better than free enterprise in many ways because the government's harnessed to be on their side. Mm. And so they're able to grab living standards, resources, and they're going to be a huge competition. Not a conspiracy. I'm not, you know, red, reds should die and all that sort of thing. It's not like the Cold War, but it is actually a new era we're, we're entering. And it's very, very important that we understand what we have to deal with. Have you had people come up to you saying, you know what, you do lay out a case, as you just have, in say 250 or 300 pages of what the problems are facing the two countries, but your solution is the wrong solution. There's got to be a different solution. Well, there's five solutions in this book, five economic models and two political models. Three, actually. But the five economic models would range from doing what the Germans did and just go for it, which is a real long shot, uh, a full-on merger. And I talk about how that would be, and that's when it becomes a thought experiment. Okay, what would that look like? Canada would get 13 states, we'd get the vice presidency, we'd own all the bonds, they'd have to pay us a lot of money, all of those things. We can do a joint venture in the north, give them right of first refusal on all the leases so they can help us develop the north in a sustainable, smart way. Or we can do a European Union where everybody stays intact, we create a fourth level of government, call it a commission, the, the binational commission, and we start to realize the synergies that I outlined in the fourth chapter of the book. Things like hydroelectric power, we have clean energy, we cannot develop because there's a border. And because there's a border, there's political risk, and because there's political risk, there's no financing. So we have these enormous assets that continentally we could do. Mexico is not part of this, by the way, no way. Mexico is not ready, maybe never to join a partnership of right. any kind. This is just a, a Canusa effort. Canusa, Can America. That's, you know, I, I don't know if you ever say it in the book, but do you have a name for this new country if it were to happen? Well, some of the American commentators, one is called it Can America, a foreign policy magazine called it Can America. Can America. Which sounds like a question. <laughs> <laughs> I want to unpack a bit of what Diane Francis had to say. One of the reasons she's pro no, if not an outright merger, then at least some kind of European Union style confederation with the United States, is that she sees billions and billions of potential resource development in the North that she believes we'll never get to unless we get into some kind of formal confederated partnership with the United States. Is she right about that? The resources have been there for millions of years. Uh, it's only somebody who owns stock in a company where they've got a lease that's going to expire in 20 years who can say if we don't do it now it's lost. No. That's one of the advantages of resources is that um, if you look after them they're still there. So it's, she's absolutely right that uh, it's, being di it's difficult to develop them now because frankly of American interference and American NGOs attacking the oil sands and any kind of resource development. and. Uh, the sheer challenge of going north like that. But the answer is Canadians can do it. Uh, and the real political negotiation should be done within Canada. Maybe the Supreme Court should review that decision that they did in which they assigned millions of square miles in effect of ownership uh, to people who were there before the white man arrived. Uh, that's the only place on earth where that's been done. I think Diane's position is you snooze, you lose here. And, and we're not moving fast enough. And there are other countries, 
who are in the neighborhood who will move faster and take advantage and will be late to the party unless we somehow confederate with the Americans to get something done. You don't see that. Putin is, although he's now been voted by Forbes as the most powerful man in the world displacing Obama, but uh, he's got demographic problems worse than almost any other country on earth because he has men dying by the age of 60 because of alcoholism. Mm -hmm. That's unique to the, and uh, he's got to defend a country with 10 time zones where he's got China on the one hand and the European Union on the other. And uh, he's, he's got resources, yes, but what um, he doesn't have is an ability to certainly take over control of the polar region. No, that's just looking at a map and drawing the wrong conclusion. Uh, okay, Diane Francis also says that if Canada and the United States got together, again, pick your option, she <laughs> laid out a bunch of them in the book, but pick whichever one you like, the new entity would be an unrivaled energy superpower in the world. Do you see that? Yes, but so what? What, uh, what any resource is, is what it does for your citizens initially is feeding their needs and beyond that how it balances the economic needs of the whole country uh, and developing resources too fast uh, creates capital strains within the country and also what you get is what's happened in the mining industry in the past when you had a, a mining boom and a camp opened and a huge new supply came out and then you had a downturn uh, a lot of companies went bust so uh, I don't believe, it's not as if the resources go away. That's the beautiful thing about it. Um, but they become more or less valuable depending on what else is going on in the world, don't they? The total reserves of oil and gas in the world are about 125 years, and that includes the fracked oil. So um, that is, isn't even half the lifespan of Canada. And at that point, if they haven't been developed in Canada, they're going to be worth a lot more than they are today. Next June, Heinz will end more than a century of tomato processing when it closes its Leamington, Ontario plant. More than 700 workers will be affected by the closure, and that doesn't take into account the hit the province's agricultural industry. Farmers, suppliers, and seasonal workers will all take. Joining us now for more on the closure, here's Andreas Bucher. He is professor in the Department of Food, Agricultural and Resource Economics at the University of Guelph, and we thank you very much for what shouldn't be, but was a two-hour drive for you to leave Guelph and get to our studios today. So thanks very much for making the effort. Thank you very much for the invitation. I want to start by having you tell us, in your view, why Heinz decided to close its plant in Leamington. Well, that's a not-so-easy question to answer because um, they have been very uh, tight-lipped about the reasons uh, for closing the plant. Um, but we have to look at to um, different levels of decision making or uh, that uh, influence the decision. The first one is, let's say, global developments or the uh, um, uh, larger economic developments. And the second one is the current situation of the plant, um, whether it needed upgraded upgrades, uh, how uh, productive and efficient the plant was. And uh, what certainly played a role was the uh, exchange rate, which is not playing um, to the favor of uh, Canadian manufacturing in general. Okay, let's pick these yeah. three apart if we can then. Yeah. Uh, global developments. What's happening around the world right now that might have been influential on that plant? It's um, a, uh, well, increasing global connections in, and trade. And um, one trend that we might see is that food manufacturers um, focus their activities on brand development, being more flexible, trying to be more flexible in uh, production, and um, being also forced to um, be more efficient and productive so that they can compete. And that certainly had an impact because what, was, what, uh, what I heard was that um, there's overcapacity in, the, uh, uh, in tomato processing uh, within the Heinz uh, Corporation. Too much supply, not enough demand. Um, too much capacity, processing capacity. They're making too much of the stuff. Uh, they could make more than they can sell. And that adds to the cost they have to look after. And uh, that's probably a very important factor in closing uh, the Heinz plant. OK, the plant itself, was there anything particularly out of date or antiquated or not up to, not up to scratch with the plant? 
uh, that's so I don't have this inside information. Uh, what I have heard is that uh, um, there haven't been any major investments in the past year, uh, years, and um, there was also talk that a uh, food safety related upgrade was needed, costing into the millions. So I um, that would need to be confirmed, but that, those might be factors that have um, influenced the, uh, the decision against Lehman. You mentioned the third thing, which was the exchange rate. But yeah. the, the Canadian dollar and the American dollar have been so close to one another for a long time right now. So yeah. why, would the, why would the currency rate be significant today as opposed to a year ago or two or three or four for that matter? Well, that's, um, you have to take a, a long-term perspective. And uh, for the, the new owners of Heinz, um, so it's the um, uh, Warren Buffett's uh, investment uh, company and a um, Brazilian investor. Uh, they might have made the decision or they might have come to the conclusion that the uh, exchange rate will stay as it is on par and um, that um, possibly uh, the uh, previous management had thought otherwise, that it might come back in, in a different way. But it's, um, um, once again, we don't have the insights in, into the right but it, decision. Presumably, it goes without saying that if the dollar were at 68 cents US again, yes. as it was 25 years ago, we wouldn't be having this conversation tonight. Um, fairly likely. Yeah. Fairly likely. Yeah. TransUnion, which apparently follows these things, it's a credit reporting agency, and they released a report recently saying that the average Canadian is carrying a personal debt load of north of $27,000, and that doesn't include mortgages. That seems shockingly high, is it? I think it is. I think it is, but you know what really shocks me is how easygoing we all are about this. We've been hearing numbers like that for so long, we just shrug them off now. I think, I think the average person, the people who have those debt loads are not hearing that number, it's not registering, it's all totally normal now to have a debt like that. If it's not mortgage, how do you go $27,000 in debt? Easy, like one afternoon easy. shopping. Easy, one afternoon shopping, you uh, put it on your credit card, you put it on your line of credit, I mean, line of credits are now supplements to your income. So it's easy and comfortable to dip into them, and you just carry that debt indefinitely. But what are you spending it on that you'd be $27,000 in the red? Well, you do a little reno job, and then you buy some electronics, and uh, maybe you put a trip on it, and bing, there you are, $27,000. Come on, no, you can't get that high that fast, can it? Oh, it sure can. I, I think you could do it, like I say, in one weekend, you could have it up to $27,000. It's so easy, you know, you just, let's say you, uh, you, uh, you redo the basement, and you buy a television for it, and you buy uh, some other equipment, and there you go. Cars, mm -hmm. maybe? Uh, yeah, I think, I think most people when they finance cars are actually using the really good financing rates the automakers are offering. But sure, you could put a car on a line of credit, easy. Hmm. Home ownership rates in Canada are approximately 68%, which means that about that percentage are not only carrying mortgage debt, but high personal debt as well. So how do you, how, how do you make it work when you are $27,000 on average in personal debt plus mortgage on top of that. Well, you know, with a line of credit, and I think that's a, one of the principal ways people are borrowing, because you're basically tapping into your home equity there, you can just make a maintenance payment every month of the interest owing, and you can carry the debt, the principal, indefinitely. As long as you're paying the interest, the bank is happy, they'll carry you, and I saw a lot of people are getting used to that. It's almost like a line item on their monthly budget, pay bank interest on my line of credit, and they keep it going like that, and they may pay it down a little bit, and then they think, oh no, I need to push it back up again because, you know, I had a, you know, some plumbing problem, and I had to pay the plumber a big bill. That's how people are getting by. I think, um, you know, incomes have not been going up tremendously much in the last little while. We're just keeping ahead of inflation there. And I think if you want to treat yourself, you've got to, uh, you've got to use credit. In terms of paying down this egregious amount of debt that uh, so many people are carrying right now, one of the things that experts like you tell us we're supposed to do all the time is cut back on what you're buying, and in particular, the frilly stuff, right. like the $5 lattes. Do well, you agree with that? No, I don't. You know what? The $5 lattes are, to me, are a trivial non-issue. Enjoy your lattes, everyone. You know what? Uh, uh, really, I mean, I treat myself to a nice coffee every now and then myself. It's the big stuff. It's the people who are financing two cars. That's where you can cut back. Your lattes are, that's, that's small change. I think people need to think big. Look at, your, look, at your, um, look at your borrowing. What are you financing? What was on your line of credit that you, that you couldn't really afford, but you treated yourself to? That, those are the things we have to cut back on. And I think cars are great wealth killers, too. I mean, I love cars. And ask anyone I know. But I, 
I've got to recognize, they just destroy wealth. What does that mean, wealth killers? Well, it means that you waste an awful lot of money owning them, and that's money you could be using for more productive things. Oh, because never mind the car, but you know, oil changes, you're going well, to have an accident, you've got insurance, all absolutely. that. Absolutely. Okay. And then there's, the, you know, then there's like the three, four, five hundred dollar car payment, and then all the costs you just mentioned. Right. Okay. Um, how important do you think it is that we actually put the brakes on and start to pay down the debt that we're now incurring? Well, I think it's quite important to do it now before interest rates rise. Because you do it now, you do it at your own comfort. You can, you, can, uh, you can be proactive and you can say, okay, I'm not under the gun now, but I will strategically make a decision to maybe not spend as much in 2014 and pay down your debt. And that way you're not whacked over the head by renewing your mortgage at a much higher rate or noting that the bank has just sent you a message saying, you know the minimum interest on your line of credit? Well, it's now up. It's a lot higher than it was before. Hmm. You, people have control now, but you won't have as much control once rates start to rise. Once upon a time, the Toronto Transit Commission subway trains ran thanks to the energy they derived from coal fire generation. Now, it's public sure. transit, so it's supposedly green, but you certainly had to belch a lot of uh, pollution into the atmosphere in order to create the power to make those trains run. So would that be considered a green project? Um, I don't think that would pass muster with most reasonable people as a green project. There is something called the Climate Bonds Initiative. It's a, it's a global initiative and has a governing council, including many uh, a, a significant number of the world's largest investors. And they are developing meticulous, detail-oriented guidance for each category of green bonds, including transit. And so that's something to watch. Uh, the World Bank, Cicero Standards, um, has a reasonable level of detail, uh, not quite as detailed as what the Climate Bonds Initiative is going forward. And that's something to watch. And I know that the Ontario government is uh, exploring these various options um, because they're, they're quite uh, intent on making sure that these bonds are 100% uh, bona fide green, green bonds and that there's a clarity for the market and so there'll be a broader uh, base of investor demand um, to buy these green bonds and, and no suspicions of greenwash. Matty, you wanted to follow up. I did. I'm still struggling a little bit to see how this is much of a game changer. If the bonds are entirely backed by the province of Ontario and we still yeah. have this large deficit and this large debt, it doesn't change any of that situation. It brings okay. in money yeah. up front, but yet we still have to have the long-term revenue tools. We still have to have the yeah. funding to pay this money back. We already have investors who are still willing to invest in Ontario. Even with the deficit and the debt, Ontario still has a bond rating that can attract investors. We can still bring in money to invest in these projects. When we do uh, in infrastructure investment on a project by project basis, we do have things called alternative finance and procurement models where the private sector is investing directly in projects already. So we've seen this in transit projects already. We have seen this taking place um, yeah. to this date and I wonder how this is really changing the game by calling these green infrastructure bonds. Toby? I, yeah, I have a, a point I'd like to make. Uh, James Carville, who used to work in the Clinton White House and was his first campaign manager for the, the White House. He said uh, he used to think when he died he wanted to come back as the, the Pope or 400 uh, hitter in baseball, but he realized, no, he wanted to come back as the bond markets because the bond markets have a lot of power. And when the government makes a promise to the bond markets, it means it's going to happen. A few years ago, Matty, I think you'll recall, the Metrolink's budget had its uh, carpet pulled out from under it, and it was because the uh, bond markets were worried that the Ontario was going to um, uh, violate some of its covenants, and they said, you have flexibility here to cut or delay this capital spending. And if you do it, uh, we will not cut your rating. And so Ontario did it because they had flexibility. If they've made a promise to bond markets that money is going to go into these things, uh, they don't have that flexibility. So this imposes a new order of discipline on the government to deliver on these promises. And it's not just words anymore. Now you have the bond markets backing it up, and that's a serious force. But the allegation was, not the allegation, the, the suggestion was that this may not be the game changer that its proponents are painting it to be. What do you think? Well, I... I I was at the press conference with the uh, Premier and the Minister of Finance and Minister of Transport, and I didn't get the whiff that it was a game changer. They talked about this being one of a variety of tools that would uh, help to make the transit strategy possible, and this is something that would deepen and broaden the pool of investors. There's still a need, an important need, as Matty uh, brings up, to raise the revenue um, for transit. We can't just go and spend $35 four, uh, billion dollars on transit and not have ways to recoup the revenue. And the Toronto Board of Trade and uh, the various political parties and a lot of the people in the uh, civil society sector are all on the same page there. And I don't think this is in any way at all. Uh, this, is, this is the strategy that goes together and complements the funding tools that will be necessary to generate the cash flows uh, to recover 
part of the expenditure to, to upgrade our transit and increase our productivity. Okay, I've heard, I've heard the expression greenwashing, Sonia, used twice already today. I just want to make sure everybody knows what that means. Greenwashing to you means what? So, for instance, you have a company who is already planning to do an investment, make a, a purchase, for instance, of changing the, the windows of their buildings, and now they realize that, hey, there's a green element to it, they were already planning on doing it, now there's a green element to it, and they issue a green bond as a result. So it's no net new investment, no net new purchases, no net new improving the environment. They were already planning on doing it, but now because it's very popular, they're going to be labeling it as green. And so the idea here with green bonds is you want to be doing new green investment something that you hadn't previously done because of this, this new financial instrument. In greenwashing, the thing would have already been done. They're just jumping on the bandwagon. So they would enjoy green. a kind of a good housekeeping seal of approval being associated with these green bonds when, in effect, they're not really adding, they're not bringing anything new to the party, so to speak. Absolutely. Huh. So how do you avoid that? I think the idea is, I mean, greenwashing does serve a, a positive in the sense that it adds credibility to a market. It shows investors that, hey, there's been demand. All of these investments were previously occurring, and it would be going forward. But I think it, it sort of goes back to the question we were saying before about what is actually green. And I think we're going to be coming back to that particular point throughout the entire show, is because if one person defines it as one thing and another person defines it as another, you always have that ambiguity, and people will continue to say, hey, it's green, but it's according to my definition. Even when, when Toby was sort of talking about previously about, hey, you have the Climate Bonds Initiative, they have their own criteria, OECD have their own criteria, as long as you have all of these different criteria, there is no standardization, and everyone can be mentioning the, the term green bond, green financing, but really referring to very, very different things. Have we made a decision yet about whose standards and criteria we're following? No, I think the green bond market is too immature at this particular point. I think they're trying to get a sense as to how large it can really be, whether this is a financially viable finance, uh, financial instrument, and as it goes, it, as it grows in higher and demand increases, I think in, in borrowers and investors are really going to drill down on the specifics. I think it's important that um, we're part of a public conversation here, and we should recognize that Ontario has done something that took some level of courage. Uh, most finance ministers and uh, premiers are really reluctant to say that we are going to ring fence and. Uh, take our freedom away from money that we collect, uh, whether it's from tax sources or from bond markets. But instead of going to the general kitty, we are going to put this in a special box and we promise for sure it's going to go there. That, that takes a level of courage. And, and there haven't been a lot of governments um, in Canada, I think Ontario is the first, to do that. And so they've, they've done this. And then we're having this discussion, trying to turn it into you know, what, were their un, uh, you know, what were their ulterior motives. And I really think this is an, uh, this is an example of, of good public policy. And it's part of a larger emerging trend, and it's something that makes sense to, I think, us just as normal citizens, too, when you think about it. We're more comfortable, I'm more comfortable giving money to the government, whether it's through taxes or through purchasing a bond, when I know what it's going for, just like I'm more comfortable giving money to a charity when I know what it's going for. And this is part of a more a general trend towards greater financial accountability in the public sector. It's not about transforming all of our tax dollars to dedicated purposes or all of the bond markets, but it's about giving a modicum to that so that we can have some intentionality and some accountability to the capital flows, which is really important to see things get done. And that is the Agenda's Week in Review. You can see all of those programs in their entirety on our website, theagenda.tvo.org, also on our iTunes channel and on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash theagenda. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.